we may wise up enough to start working together for a better world, for a better material ambience, first of all, in which human dignity is possible. It's hard to have human dignity if you're an economic or physical slave, if you don't have enough to eat or drink, if you are cold when it's cold and wet when it's raining because you've got no shelter, when your children have no possible hope for an education, when you never see a doctor from the day you're born to the day you die, and there's no medicine around even if there isn't a doctor, when all of your hope is shriveled up because people are taking the good things of the earth, including intelligence and talent as well as treasure, and spending them mostly on machines of destruction when we might be spending them on education and health and and uh, creating a better world. Please welcome Dr. Robert J. Dempsey, celebrating 50 years as a graduate of the class of 1973. He is the Javid Professor and Chairman of the Department of Neurological Sciences at the University of Wisconsin. He is also this year's Dooley Award winner. Dr. Dempsey was called to serve all over the world. Thank you. Thank you. On a blustery November evening, 1972, a student was running through campus. Seems he always ran. But that night, he saw a light in the administration building window. He ran up the steps, burst into the office of a man who did not know him, and burst out, the president was wrong and you were right. Because that was the day that Nixon dismissed Theodore Hesburgh from the Civil Rights Commission because Hesburgh insisted on doing what was right. And Father Ted turned those piercing eyes on me and reassured me and taught me a lesson in integrity, justice, and perseverance. Today we're talking about service, and I assure you, none of that is possible without these special angels that inspire us each day to find the joy and passion in an imperfect world, and we have to thank them. I've worked on five continents. I've met people worldwide. And I assure you that each of us have the same values or pillars of our life, faith, family, peace, and health. If one of them crumbles, all of them will. If we in our own way do something to build one of those pillars, we may support them all. I learned this so clearly from so many people. My parents, who took an unruly group of kids and taught them faith and family. Thank you, Mom and Dad. But they asked more that we each in our own would do our very best with whatever little gifts God had given us. They sent it out, us out each day with the message, remember you're a Dempsey. And we tried. And it was hard because the schools were not very good. We literally attended one school where I thought crime and punishment were career opportunities. <laughs> it was a scholarship to Notre Dame that taught me it was Russian literature. But that time, coming to Notre Dame campus at the time of Hesburgh, it was on, I was on fire. It was a time of passion, of war, of peace, of justice, of opportunity and challenge, and I caught fire. I learned religion, theology from John Donne. I learned to write from Tom Wirge. My teammates on the track team taught me about trust and working together. The children at the Children's Hospital taught me that medicine might be a career. I did a service trip to Appalachia, and my eyes were opened, an urban child, to what was rural poor and health disparity. But I also saw there a carpenter who worked with joy, passion, and helped others. And I realized, it's, you don't have to be a brain surgeon to serve. You could be a carpenter. You could do what you do well, and it has meaning. And several scholarships later, I was a neurosurgeon. And I work in Appalachia, I work on Indian reservations, I work on five continents, and I love the work. I love it because of the patients and what they give to me in trust and courage. And it is a unique specialty because you cannot do complete care of trauma, tumor, stroke, pain, or congenital anomalies of children without neurosurgery. Yet it is absent, no opportunity for 5.5 billion people in the world. And the impact of that was very clear to me when I went to Guatemala and tried to provide health care and failed miserably because the peace pillar had collapsed and with it faith, family, and health. But in that country, I met a small child who 
who taught me in her own way that I would have to teach if I wanted to care for her in the future. And I also learned of trust, because when that war enveloped me, it was those Guatemalans that got me to safety, and I thank them. In Ecuador, the doctors there taught me how to teach, because they taught me, first you must learn to listen. It's not about us. We're serving them. What do they need? What do we provide? It was education. We built a program of training, and they taught me how to overcome challenges, from as simple as lost equipment to as unusual as the volcanoes erupting during your surgery, Dr. Dempsey. <laughs> Notre Dame never taught me what to do when the volcano erupts during <laughs> surgery. But we got through, and we made something special. And when an insurrection in terribly endangered my family, those brave people got them out, and I thank them every day of my life. Africa came, and people at a foundation said there are 400 million people in sub-Saharan Africa with no access to the care you provide. Can you help? And I said, let's be bold. Be careful about that. They put you in charge of the foundation. <laughs> and we said, let's train, <coughs> let's train them there, just the way we do here. Curriculum. Uh, certification, government support, equipment, we can do that. And some ideas catch fire. Just like Yates said, education is not filling a pail, but starting a fire. Hundreds of doctors, nurses, politicians, soldiers, equipment people joined on. And 27 programs sprung up from Kenya to A Afghanistan, from Vietnam to Cameroon, from Nicaragua to Bolivia. Uganda, and sometimes joy and passion can be contagious. I learned so much from these brave people, overcoming challenges. I helped train the first female neurosurgeon in Mali and the first female neurosurgeon in Niger. And when I took her aside and said, what are your challenges? What do you fear? I thought she would say lost equipment. She said, no, I fear being murdered by Boko Haram because I'm an educated woman. And all I could say was, I have no problems. We're here for you. Because sometimes challenges are inspirational. When Haiti literally fell to the ground in an earthquake, the people said, come and try to convince this government to fund education and not just handouts. And we're trying. When the World Health Organization finally realized that if 5.5 billion people have no access to specialized surgery, that means 47 million people a year die unnecessarily. That's more than AIDS, more than COVID, more than war. And so when we said we have an educational program, could we spread that? Every single country in the world, every Minister of Health signed on. That never happens. But for this idea, it did, and that's inspirational. And now we have thousands of doctors treating millions of people and so much more to do. Because you see, such courage is, such Courage can be inspirational as well. When Notre Dame said, would you come and help us build a pre-med program, but it needs to be in honor of Father Ted, I said, of course. But by then, those piercing eyes had failed him, but not his courage, not his passion, or his ability to inspire. Because you see, this whole idea of service is based on those people who inspire us to do what gives us joy and passion with and for others, working together to build as one of those pillars, we build them all. And I don't care if you're a carpenter, a plumber, a poet, a priest, a teacher, a lawyer, a neurosurgeon, or a dishwasher, we can all play a role. And we will know you by your gratitude. So I very much thank Notre Dame. I very much thank Father Ted for inspiring all of this today as he did before. And mostly, I thank you all so very much for inspiring me. And may God bless.